Okay, so welcome everyone. Tonight's speaker is Raquel Goldberg, who is a wills and estates lawyer and moved here to Toronto 16 years ago from New Jersey. She serves on the board and on many committees and is an active participant of the Women's Divary Torah program and the Women's Megillah program. And we're really excited for Raquel to speak today. Great, thank you. Okay, let me just... One second. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome and Chodesh Tov. Um, so tonight I wanted to speak about, um, obviously about Pesach, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and specifically about matzah. Um, hopefully we will be talking about some things that are new. We've all been learning about matzah since we were three years old. So hopefully we've got some new things to learn about tonight. Um, and actually what I'm sort of most excited about is actually talking about some of the things that we that will not be new to us, but thinking about them in new ways. So, so bear with me, and and uh, that is a that is a commitment that I hope will uh, will bear fruit by the end. Um, the uh, the way this um, my share is going to be organized tonight, really in four parts. So the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the story of the Exodus in the Torah to identify the locations where matzah appears in the story. I then want to consider the symbolic meanings of matzah in where it appears in that story. It appears more than once. And I want to think about and talk about what the, what the symbolic meaning is in those different places. Um, the third thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the Haggadah to see how those symbolic meanings in the Torah, in this historical account, how, those, how that then fits into our ritualistic Pesach observance today. Um, and then what I want to do is I really want to reflect on how not just these particular symbolic meanings of matzah fit into our Pesach observance, but really how matzah as a symbol works. So not just what the symbolic meanings are, but how matzah, what makes matzah as a symbol, a unique type of symbol, and the relationship between that and uh, and the particular holiday of Pesach. And that last piece um, will hopefully become much more clear to everybody as we as we proceed. Um, so to clarify, tonight we're gonna be talking about matzah as a symbol, and we're gonna be talking about it as a symbol and its significance, but really in two very different ways. The first way is what the object of matzah symbolizes in the story of the Exodus. So we have matzah and it symbolizes various things. And we can kind of look at it that way, just like maror symbolizes certain things, the number four might symbolize certain things, matzah symbolizes certain things. And the second way though, that I wanna talk about matzah as a symbol is what the unique characteristics of this symbol is and where that fits into the um, holiday of Pesach. Cause I think there is a unique connection there. So again, the first thing I want to do, we're going to do tonight, is we're going to look at where matzah appears in the historical um, account in the Torah of the story of Exodus, and of the story of the Exodus. And for that, we're really going to turn to today's maftir of, of um, Shmot Parak Bet, the 12th Parak of Shmot, um, um, where, um, where God um, gives the commandments regarding Pesach. So I, um, I, what I would like to do is I would like to, I'm going to share my screen to just open up the text of that parak. The parak is very, very long. We're not going to do the whole thing and we're not going to be doing a close reading, um, but I'm just going to have it open so we can kind of scroll down as I, what I'd like to do is um, identify the different sections um, for the first 39 verses. There are 39 verses and I just want to sort of chunk, make them into chunks and say, you know, explain these chunks are doing this and then we'll move on to the next because that structure will be helpful in the analysis. So I'm just going to share my screen on that. Hold on. Okay, so we have, we have um, Shmot Parak Bet here. Everybody can hope and can see it. Okay, so we have the, the Parak begins with God speaking to Moshe and Aaron in Mitzrayim. And the first 13 verses um, consists of God giving Moshe and Aaron the commandment regarding what's, what's known as Pesach Mitzrayim, meaning the commandments regarding what the Jews in Egypt that year were to do the, for the night of Makat Bechorot. What do they have to do? And it really, all the commandments, pretty much all of them, um, really relate to the Korban Pesach. It relates to taking this lamb. So, so we have... Um, 
we have in the third verse, right? Speak to the whole nation, tell them on the 10th day, they, they take their lamb and you keep going down. And this is the type of lamb it has to be. It's gonna be by household. They keep it until the 14th, then they slaughter it. They have to spread the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. Um, and then we have, um, which I'm going to come back to. So that night, the night of Makapachorot, they shall eat the meat of the Korban Pesach. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. So that's going to be matzah appearance number one, right? They're going to eat it that night. Then we keep going more about the Korban Pesach. You can't eat it. You can't eat it cooked. Shouldn't be, you can't eat it boiled. It has to be roasted. We have um, the 11th verse, they have to eat, they should, they are commanded that they're going to eat the Korban Pesach with their belts on and their sandals on and their staffs in their hand, and they shall eat it b'chi pazon, they shall eat it hurriedly, they shall be eating it ready to go, ready to move. Um, and while that's happening, they, God is going to be passing through Mitzrayim and, you know, Makat B'cholrot will be happening and the blood will be protecting, the blood on the doorposts will be the sign and, and God will pass over the houses of the Jews. So that's verses 1 to 13. Then we have, starting in verse 14, we have verses 14 to 20. This is still all God commanding Moshe and Aaron at Rosh Chodesh. These are all commandments happening at the time of Rosh Chodesh. So 14 to 20, we have God now giving the commandment of what's called Pesach Dorot. So we had Pesach Mitzrayim, which is that night in Egypt. And then we have Pesach Dorot, which is the holiday of Pesach for, for all time. And now in these psukim of 14 to 20, this commandment, so you can see, this day shall be to you one of remembrance. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout the ages. You shall celebrate it as an institution for all time. And what's very interesting in reading this is that in these verses 14 to 20, right after we had Pesach Mitzrayim, which is all about the Korban Pesach, it's, you know, all of it is about the lamb. In these verses, what we're really seeing is a holiday of matzah and not even chametz. So in these verses, there is no reference to the Korban Pesach at all. Um, the, these verses, the commandment or references, there are, there are four references to eating matzah. And there are five references to either destroying se'or or not eating chametz. So this Pesach Dorot is all about eating matzah and not eating chametz, even though well, the Pesach Mitzrayim that we've just been commanded is all about the Korban Pesach with, there is a reference to matzah, but you know, a reference sort of as a side dish, it's incidental almost to the Korban Pesach. The Korban Pesach is the main event of Pesach Mitzrayim. Then moving on, we have, um, we have the Pesukim of 21 to 28, which is where Moshe then summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, go pick out a lamb. Basically, these are the verses where Moshe then, then transmits these commandments to the elders. And these verses end, and, and, the, and the commandments that, he's, that, that the Torah relates really refer again to the Korban Pesach. And he even does refer to future observance, but he refers to the future observance of the Korban Pesach, not specifically matzah and chametz. And then we have in the 28th, Pesach 28, um, so the people do as they were commanded. And, you know, presumably that means the whole Pesach Mitzrayim that they've been commanded, all the details there. Then we have verses 29 to 32, where Makat Bechorot occurs. You know, now, now we're not doing commandments, you know, for what's going to happen 14 days from now and for all eternity. It's now we're back to the, to the, present day of the Exodus and Maka Pechorot occurs, 29 to 32, right? 29, we have Bachatzi Alayla, God is Hikak Kol Bechor Be'eretz Mitzrayim, okay? They, and then what happens is Paro summons Moshe and Aaron and says, leave, time to go get out, okay? That's 29 to 32. Then we have 33, um, basically 33, 34 is then the Egyptians um, get very scared and they're rushing the Jews out. Pasuk 34, very important. So the people, because the Egyptians are now rushing them out, after having partaken of their Korban Pesach meal, they also have dough for the next day sitting, you know, rising in their proofing drawers, right? That now the Egyptians are rushing them out. So they grab their dough before it's had a chance to rise and they pop it on their shoulders to get out. They go and they ask their neighbors for the gold and for the silver and they leave, right? They leave. Then we have Sukim 35 um, going to 39. So they ask for the gold and silver and then they leave. 
And then we, and they leave Mitzrayim, Pasuk 37, by Yeshu B'nai Yisrael Miram Ses. They leave, Rams, they leave Ramses and they go to Sukkot and, and Pasuk 39, when they're, I guess, at Sukkot or on their way to Sukkot, so as we know this very familiar, they get to Sukkot or they're on their way to Sukkot, and now they take that dough that was on their shoulders, it, was, it had, didn't have a chance to rise because they were rushed out of Egypt by the Egyptians, and they bake matzot now in Sukkot, okay? So that's, we're going we're gonna to leave this now here, but that would be appearance number two in the story of matzah. So we have two very, we have two distinct appearances of matzah in the story. First, we have the matzah that accompanies the Korban Pesach, and then we have the matzah that appears um, what in Sukkot, the matzah that they that they bake from the dough that they took with them, right? And obviously there are references to matzah for the future Pesach Dorot, but in the story itself, we have two, we have two appearances or two occurrences of matzah. Okay, so that's contextually important to understand how the how this story plays out in the Chumash. So again, we have these two matzahs, matzah, what I'm, what I'm going to call to, I just have, you know, shorthand here of matzah Mitzrayim and matzah Sukkot, right? The matzah Mitzrayim is what they ate in Mitzrayim, the leil, you know, leil makat bechorot that night, and matzah Sukkot is the matzah that they, that they baked, not because they were commanded to, but because they were rushed out and they took this dough and it didn't have a chance to rise. Okay, so that's, that's where it appears. So now let's talk about what these two different instances of matzah, what the matzah sort of represents or means in each of these two instances. So the matzah Sukkot I'm actually going to start with because it's the easiest, right? This is the matzah that they built, that they baked in Sukkot, right? We know we know what it stands for. We know what it re symbolizes because the Torah tells us, right? It says, um, coming back, it was, um, sorry, let me now share that. Sorry, give me one second. We'll share here. So just coming back um, in Pasuk, Lamed Tet, right? We know they that what this what the second matzah represented, right? It was the matzah that they why was why did they make this matzah? Kigor Shumi Mitzrayim over here, right? Kigor Shumi Mitzrayim, they they were rushed out, they were they were you know chased out of Egypt very quickly that night, and there was no opportunity for the dough to rise. So in some sense, that matzah, we know what it we know what it's about. It's it's meant to symbolize the being or to mem to remember them being rushed out of Egypt, this very dramatic and and this dramatic exodus that that really felt like there may have been a long long process of four hundred years, but in an instant they're now freed. Right? It's really this moment this this moment of becoming free, very very quickly. Right? But now going back, so what, is, what does the matzah mitzrayim symbolize? Because they're eating matzah and God commands them to eat matzah with their korban Pesach. And that has not, that, that this whole thing of being rushed out has not happened yet, right? So it's not about being rushed out. What was that matzah about, right? So, so when I first looked into this, what I'd actually expected to find, I expected to find Mifarshim who said, oh, you know, God commanded it and it was a siman because God knew it was going to happen or he told Moshe Baruch HaKodesh this was going to happen. That's what I thought I would find. Did not find that anywhere. That is not what I found. And in fact, there was not a lot of commentary on the commandment to eat the Korban Pesach with matzah. There was actually a surprising dearth of commentary on that where I had expected a lot more, but I will share what I did find. So first I have, first we have the Rosh Bam. Um, the Rosh Bam, um, if, does anybody else, would anybody like to read the Rosh Bam over here? I don't know, if, I don't, I'm not great with unmuting. I don't know how to make it happen. Anna, do you want to read the Rosh Bam? I can, uh, okay. okay, yeah, which one? Vas Luet of yeah, what's highlighted? Abachlud Habasar? Yeah, Abachlud Habasar Balayla Hazad Sli Eish Begomer. Konyi Nene Achila Derech Hipazon Ve Mihirut Hu Kaadam Hanech Paz Lalecha. All aspects of this eating are characterized by haste, like a person who is hurried to go. Okay, thank you. So, so for the Rashbam, the matzah of Mitzrayim of the of eat, that's eaten with the korban Pesach, it does actually sound a little like you know something in common with the matzah of, of Sukkot in that it has to do with being hurried. But where but but Rashbam is not pulling his interpretation from the matzah of Sukkot. What he's pulling it from is pasuk yud aleph, which is where God is instructing what is what are other aspects of this meal of the Korban Pesach that the people have to wear their belts and their shoes on and their staff in hand because that's the Pasuk where we see the word chipazon where they're told you have to you have to um well actually I'll scroll up over there because I have uh do I have that I think I do 
Um, no, I don't. I thought I had it over here. Sorry. So in 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 the eleventh verse, which is when God is still commanding Moshe about how the Jews are to eat the korban Pesach in Mitzrayim. In addition to that first one where we learned they eat it with they eat it roasted and with matzah and maror, now in Pasuk in Pasuk Yud Aleph, he says, and they have to eat it wearing wearing their belts and their shoes and their staffs in hand, and they should eat it the pazon. So when the Rashbam says that all of the, the matters, aspects of this meal and the way that they're told to command to, to eat are derechli pazon, he's not pulling that from the matzah that happens in Sukkot, he's pulling it from Pasuk Yud Aleph and the other aspects of the meal in Mitzrayim. So, and so in what way is, is matzah characterized by haste? It's characterized because you cook it, bake it quickly, right? You mix your dough, you just, you know, it's, 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 it's two ingredients, it's flour and water, you mix it quickly, you, you know, you bake it, it's a quick bake, you, you know, you bake it high heat quickly and it's done. So it's, it's a fast eating. Now, why is it important that they be eating the Um, That's a whole other shear. I was actually just talking about that with Avital this week. So that's a whole other question. But I think very briefly, one quick idea to just kind of keep this moving though is that this meal was to have a character of eating on the run, right? That they are ready to go. This is this is not, we're sitting, we're, you know, 400 years, we got time. It's it's showing they're ready to move. They, 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 they're, they're not, they're not sitting and lazing around and really in this meal. They're sort of eating quickly because they're ready to move at a moment's notice. Not, I don't think, be, I don't think because the Egyptians are going to rush them out. I think it's more that they have to be ready to move as soon as Moshe and Aharon and God say it's time to move. And, and it, what happens is, of course, that the Egyptians are rushing them out. But I think the commandment to be ready is really meant to get them in the state of mind that they are ready to act as soon as God gives them the word. So that's the rush bomb, which is the matzah here is really representing some sort of haste in the same way that the wearing shoes on their feet represents haste in that they're ready to move, that there's no delay that has to happen. I'm not exactly sure where the Rosh Bam sees the, the roasted eating and the marors fitting into this. And so it's actually interesting that he that he gives this commentary on this pasuk, but but I'm gonna you know use that to, to understand what he's saying about the matzah. The next one I wanna speak about is the chizkuni. Um, so the chizkuni on, um, on this pasuk of the commandment to eat, you know, roasted and with matzah and maror. So he doesn't actually speak about the, about the matzah, but he says two things about the roasting and the maror that I think we can extend to the matzah. So for the roasting, um, and you can see on the source sheet here, I'm just going to highlight it over here. So he says, Sli'esh, so why do they, why do the carbon Pesach have to be roasted? Why? Because when you roast something that the smell wafts, and God wanted this smell to waft to the Egyptians' noses so that the, no, the, the Egyptians would know that the Jews were eating their God, okay? That they were eating their god, and then what does he say? Al mirorim. Why did they have to eat it with maror? Kol zed derech bizayon sheyochluhu im davar ra umar velo im davar chashuv matok. So why? I wrote biter. It should say bitter with bitter herbs. All this is a matter of degradation. That you will eat the lamb with something bad and bitter, and not with something important and sweet. So why do they have to eat with maror? Not the chizkuni doesn't say because vayemaru chayehem but rather because it's a way of degrading the lamb as the Egyptian deity. And I think we can say the same thing really about the matzah. The matzah is the lowest form of bread, right? It's the most basic. Again, two ingredients, no time, no eggs, no yeast, no rising. No, it's, you make it on the run, you make it quickly, you eat it, it's a quick little cracker. It's very lowly, right? Doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't cost a lot of time. It doesn't have a lot of flavor. And in a sense, the same way that eating the, Korban Pesach with maror was degrading to the lamb. So eating it with a matzah that is a, that is a very simple form of bread is also degrading. And if we use the Chizkuni's words in the maror, right? It's it's veloim davar chashuv. It was not eaten with with the something important of you know really important and fancy bread. Okay. And I, and I just want to, as, an, as a, you know, just a sort of a side point, but I think it's important, is that, you know, when we're talking about degrading the Egyptians' god, um, that while the, the roasting part is with reference to what the Egyptians will smell and, and know, the maror and the matzah was happening inside the house. The Egyptians did not know that the Jews were eating the lamb with bitter herbs and with, and with lowly bread. And so I think the degradation there was not meant to be taunting the Egyptians, but rather to be for the purpose of the of B'nai Israel to internalize their for themselves that they were rejecting the Egyptians God 
and basically throwing in their lot with God. They were aligning themselves with the God of their ancestors and rejecting the Egyptian God. And that was a critical thing to be doing before they left Egypt and became the nation of of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So I think that's kind of where that degradation fits in. So again, the Chizkuni doesn't actually speak to the matzah, but where he speaks to the Tzliyesh and Amorim, I think it, it fits in pretty, it's easy enough to see where the matzah would fit in with that. The last source I wanted to read on the matzah of uh, Mitzrayim is Rav Hirsch in translation. And it's a little long, but I just thought it was really quite beautiful, even in, in translation. Um, and so I wanted to uh, to read that. I don't know if somebody else wants to wants to read it. I have it on the screen. Um, would anybody like to read that? Maybe Shana? You want to unmute? Are you able to unmute? Oh, here, hold on, I can do that. And if it does, okay, did that work? Okay. Do you hear okay. me? Yep. Okay. All right, so Rav Shimshon Reforal Hirsch. Um, just at the moment of the Exodus, their oppressors did not grant them time even to leaven their bread. So they had to take it out with them as matzah. So during the whole period of their slavery, they did not get time even for leavening their bread. The whip of the overseer and the breathless rush of the overwhelming labor was always behind them and only permitted the quickest and easiest preparation of their food. So matzah is the real bread of slaves. This is to keep alive in our minds the fact that right up to the moment of redemption, the pressure still lay heavily on us. We were still the same slaves in the power of the Egyptians. And it was God and God alone who granted us freedom. We ourselves had not the slightest hand in it. Thank you. Okay, great. So for Rev Hirsch, um, matzah, both the matzah of, um, really for Rev Hirsch actually, both the matzah of Mitzrayim and the matzah of Sukkot is representing, um, representing slavery, representing that the that B'nai Israel were not the ones actually in control of what was happening, but but putting aside the, the matzah of, of Sukkot, just re reflecting now on matzah of Mitzrayim. So he's talking about matzah as slave food. And why is it slave food? It's slave food because it has, you have to bake quickly when you're a slave because there is always somebody breathing down your neck. You do not have a chance to sit down and relax and take your time. Um, and it's not just this idea of, oh, you know, your time doesn't belong to you. It's really this very powerful image of the whip of the overseer and the breathless rush of the overwhelming labor was always behind them and only permitted the quickest and easiest preparation of their food. So for Rav Hirsch, the, the matzah in Mitzrayim really represents slavery, right? Very simply, it is being a slave. Now, why did, what was the purpose of that symbol? Why did they need to have the symbol of slavery at their meal in Mitzrayim. So for Rav Hirsch, it's, I think, to show them that they were still slaves at that moment. They had not been freed and they were still slaves. And as God is about to free them, they need to know that they are still slaves and understand that. I think we could also say that, you know, it was, it could also just have been for them to reflect upon it, right? They're about to leave. And that's a good moment to reflect on where you're coming from as you as your promised um, liberation is, is about to be upon you. So I think it could also simply be, you know, why was it important for them to be, be reflect, having a symbol of slavery at this meal? Maybe it's so that they understood that they were still slaves or maybe it was just so they could reflect on the experience of slavery in the state that they were about to be leaving as they were um, about to be freed. Okay, so that's where sort of we have some various symbolic meanings in the Torah for these um, for the, the two places that matzah appears in the story of the Exodus. Um, and so we have these, these matzah of, of, of Mitzrayim having a few different ideas of what it might symbolize, and then matzah of Sukkot really having one, one idea because the Torah tells us what it effectively what it symbolizes. So then the question is, so which matzah are we commemorating when we celebrate Pesach, right? Are we commemorating the matzah of Sukkot or the matzah of Mitzrayim? And for that, to answer that question, I would like to look at the Haggadah because that tells us a lot about what we're doing when we have, when we have, um, when we celebrate Pesach and we eat matzah. And before I go to the Haggadah, would anybody like to answer this question? And it is not a trick question, but which matzah are we, are we commemorating when we eat matzah at our Seder? Does anybody want to suggest anything? Well, I, I think we could actually have both. Okay, mm -hmm. there's no reason why it has to be one and not the other, except that I mean we do talk about lechem oni, and we talk about and I mean, um, 
I mean, I, I'm trying to, to you know, think of what we have in the Haggadah, but we have multiple references. I mean, we begin, we begin with Lechem Oni, right? But mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, I think later on, as we come to, like, before we eat matzah, we have, I'm just, because we have, we do talk about uh, yep. right? Yep. So we yep. are, we are referencing the other. Um, yep. And I think in everything that we're doing on at the Haga, uh, on Pesach, in terms of recognizing the, the um, being brought from the freedom, from the freedom of the slavery to our, uh, you know, from Avdut to Avodat Hashem. I mean, I think it just, the same root word, you know, I involved Dalit, I mean, Veit Dalit, I mean, we're really recognizing about everything about right. all those aspects so, that you're referring so yeah, to. Yeah, as I said, not a trick question, and I completely agree, and so I'm just going to um, share my screen again, because this is, again, things that we're very familiar with, we say them every year, um, but let's just look at it, right? As Rebecca said, we start Magid with Halach Ma'anya, this is the bread of destitution, affliction, avatana that our ancestors ate be'ara dimitrayim, in the land of Egypt. Now, maybe that means in the land of Egypt for all the years that they were slaves, that it was slave food, that it was it was lowly food, or maybe it means that they ate the night of the Korban Pesach when they were in Mitzrayim and there was this matzah on the table that we've seen that they were commanded to eat. But we see that we start off with the matzah that represents something lowly, whether it's slavery, whether it's being rushed, whether it's... Um, just not having good ingredients, that it's just sort of a lowly and basic form of bread for poor people, something the lowly type of matzah, that's, that we see right away in the beginning of Magid when we refer to it as lachma anya, the, the, some sort of lowly form of bread. And then of course, when we end Magid, we end Magid by saying there are three things we have to say on Pesach in order to fulfill our obligation. We have to say Pesach matzo maror, and when we talk about the matzah, what do we say? We say matzah zosha anu ochlim al shuma. This matzah that we're eating, why do we eat it? Al shum shalohi speak bitzei kam shalavotenu lachamitz ad shenigla lehem melech machay hamlachim makadosh baruch hu gealam. Right? Why do we eat this matzah on Pesach? To remember the bread that couldn't rise, right? The matzah of Sukkot that there was no chance to rise. Really, I mean, then we say until God, you know, re revealed Himself and redeemed them, meaning until they became God's people, right? They were rushed out in the process from Mitzrayim. Uh, but again, it's that, it's that matzah of Sukkot that didn't have a chance to rise, right? So we see both, we see both matzah Mitzrayim and we see matzah of Sukkot. And again, the matzah of Mitzrayim being this like lowly form, some sort of low, something associated with lowly things or negative things. And then the matzah of Sukkot, which has a bit more of an uplifting feel because it's associated with being freed, right? And, and quite beautifully, actually, what, by having the, what, what's really interesting to me is in the structure of Magid, we start with the Lechem of Mitzrayim and we move to the Lechem of Sukkot, which is in fact what happened with the Jews in Egypt, right? They started with the Lechem of Mitzrayim and they moved to the Lechem of Sukkot, of Sukkot the Matzah of Sukkot, right? That they had that as well, of Matzah being one thing and then becoming an other, another thing. And that's really going to be the key, the key thing I want to talk about, I want to move on to, which is part three, which is what does all this have to do with anything, right? We've all, we, we've all learned like lots of things that matzah can symbolize, right? So, so what am I saying here? Who cares? I mean, not who cares, but like what's new about that? So matzah symbolizes, has all these meanings. And, and what I really want to focus on here is that what we've actually seen is not just that matzah can symbolize all sorts of things, but that matzah began, it started symbolizing one thing or multiple things, but that are all kind of negative. It had certain symbolic meaning, when Bnei Yisrael ate that matzah on the night of Makat Bechorot. And that was all the meanings that it had. It didn't have for them this other meaning. And later on, a day or two later, not very long, but a day or two later, it acquired an entirely new significance. And today when we eat matzah, we hold both of these, both of these aspects at once. And so what really interests me uh, in, about matzah as a symbol is that its symbolic meaning changed over time and it actually evolved with the experience, the historical experience of the Jewish people. It started out with certain meanings and it acquired new meanings later. And all of those meanings are incorporated into the, the, this, sim, this symbol that we're meant to engage with when we now celebrate Pesach. 
So again, even for the Jews who left Egypt, matzah symbolized more than one thing, right? It's not just us with our commentaries and our this, like even for the Jews who left Egypt, they ate matzah with their Korban Pesach and it meant something to them then. And then a few days later, they had this other experience with matzah and now matzah means something different. And so the next year when it's Pesach and they're eating matzah in the Midbar, they have two different things that they're thinking about. And the second thing did not exist the first time that they ate matzah. The first night when they ate a Korban Pesach in Mitzrayim, they did not think of matzah as having anything to do with freedom. It did not mean being freed, being rushed out, being saved by God. It only meant the things that it meant for them that night in Mitzrayim, the very first time, okay? And I don't think that it's um, it's just sort of a quirky thing about matzah, or it's an interesting thing that its meaning has ev did evolved with different experiences that we see in the Torah, that we see its meaning evolving and its significance evolving in the Torah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just a coincidence and I don't think it's just something sort of quirky or interesting. I think it actually is quite essential and, and central to the holiday of Pesach and how we're meant to celebrate it. So we have to remember that God designated matzah as the primary symbol of the holiday from the start. So going back to the very beginning, we we're talking about the 12th parak of Shemot, right? God gives Moshe and Aaron all the commandments about how the Jews are to do the Korban Pesach in Mitzrayim. And then he gives the commandment of Pesach Dorot where he talks all about matzah and maror, I mean matzah and chametz. Moshe probably has no idea what he's talking about. Why is matzah and chametz a big deal? But okay, that's what God's telling me. It's gonna be this big holiday of matzah and chametz. But the point is God designated matzah as this primary symbol of the holiday before it acquired its next meaning. And I think that God did this knowing that, that this new, this second significance, the second meaning was yet to come. And maybe, maybe the reason that God chose matzah as the primary symbol is not because of the particular symbolic meanings, meaning that he didn't necessarily, maybe he didn't choose matzah as the principal symbol because it symbolized lechem oni or because it symbolized slavery or because it symbolized being rushed because we have other symbols that symbolize all those things, right? We have maror, which symbolizes slavery. We could say we have to wear belts or we could wear, have to wear shoes, right? That could, be, that could be our, maybe staffs in hand. That could have been our symbol for being rushed out, right? Why, why matzah? Maybe not because of the particular symbolic meanings, but because of the fact that it's meaning changed over time. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is that matzah is not just a symbol of particular things, but it's a symbol that shows us how symbolic meaning works. It shows us how symbols work and that a symbol's power lies not in being static, but in being dynamic. And that its power lies partially in the way that meaning can evolve with the experience of the person doing the interpreting. Um, so that's, that's a really important point. If anybody wants me to repeat that, I can. But again, just briefly, the idea being that what makes matzah such a powerful symbol is what it tells us about what how symbolic meaning works, that it ch can change and evolve and become richer with the experience that the person doing the interpreting brings to it. And, and very, very briefly, um, I wanna share a, um, a few pages of the, the favorite Pesach book in, in the Goldberg's house. Yes, Shana says, aha, meta meeting. Yes, exactly. Um, I was trying to get through this year without saying meta because I was like, oh, it's going to scare people. But yes, that was what I was thinking. Um, so the favorite, the favorite Pesach book in our house is called A Sweet Passover. And it is an absolutely charming and lovely Pesach book. My in-laws gave it to us a number of years ago. We bring it out every year. We read it many times over the holiday. It's fantastic. Um, and I just want to share a few pages from this book. And just for context, it's a book where there's a sto the story is um, there's a little girl who loves Pesach and loves matzah, and she eats matzah every single day, one day with jam, one day with tuna fish, every day. She's so excited. And by the last day, she has a stomach ache and is totally sick of matzah. And I think I love this book because we can all relate to that. Um, and on the last day, she's like, I'm never eating matzah again. I'm too sick of it. And all of the adults in the house um, basically say to her, but Miriam, matzah is so beautiful and important because, and you'll miss it, won't you miss it when you won't, when you, when you refuse to eat it again. So I just want to share, share this quickly um, because I love it, but also because it is on point. So here we have the adults in the, in the family. So, so, so mom, so um, does anybody want to read this? It's really great. Maybe, maybe the Parkers want to read this because they have this book also. <laughs> We've You're really been reading it all week. <laughs> like, really the at best least 15 times. Okay. Not even on Passover, asked mommy. 
But Miriam, we always eat mutts on Passover. How else will we remember that our ancestors were slaves in Egypt? And when Pharaoh granted them freedom, they had to leave in such a rush. They couldn't even wait for the bread dough to rise. How else will we remember that even the plainest food eaten in freedom tastes sweeter than the fanciest food eaten in slavery, Daddy asked. That's why we say, have a zis and Pesach, Grandma told Miriam. <laughs> Have a sweet Passover. Matzah is such a simple food, it reminds us to be humble, explained Uncle Nathan. It doesn't puff itself up, and we shouldn't puff ourselves up either. It's a mitzvah to eat matzah, and Rachel added, a good deed. And just as the matzah was baked in a hurry, we should always be in a hurry to do a good deed whenever we can. Last one. <laughs> matzah goes with everything, Grandpa said, and that reminds us that we should get along with everyone too. Perfect. And if all Thank those reasons... Okay. <laughs> well, the next part was just- That's the most important part. It's true, sorry, Rena, finish it up, take it away. <laughs> and if all those reasons weren't enough for us, Dayenu, Grandma said, your grandfather happens to make the best matzabrai in the world. Fabulous. Rachel, you. can you repeat the name of the book? Uh, yeah, it's called A Sweet Passover. Um, it is, one sec. Um, this is what it looks like <laughs> and it's fantastic. Highly recommend it. It's available on Amazon. We just bought it for my niece. It's really, it is really my, our favorite Pesach book. Um, okay, so why did I want Rena to read that other than because I think it's charming? And the reason is because again, what it, what it represents, I think, is the way that matzah continues to evolve and have new meanings as new people come to the table. Right? The idea that matzah we, is a symbol of being humble for ourselves. That's, that's an interesting idea, right? The idea that matzah gets along with everything, goes well with things, and we should. There are different ideas in this story, and I, and I like this, the notion, again, or this example of new people bringing their own experiences to the table in how they interpret the symbol. So now, going back again, this is part, this is the last part. So we talked about where matzah appears in, this, in the historical narrative uh, or the narrative in the Torah of this historical exodus, two places. We talked about the different meanings of these two occurrences or appearances of matzah. We talked about the fact that the way that matzah has, has a significance that evolves in the story is itself an important thing for us to be doing on Pesach. And now I wanna talk about why. Why do I think that that aspect of matzah as a symbol is important? And for that, um, we're going to go back to the Haggadah. And this is the last, I think my last screen share. So then you'll just get to see my face. Here we go. Also, again, something we've all read many times, not new, but hopefully we're thinking about it a little differently. What does the Haggadah tell us? What do we say in Magid? In each and every generation, a person is obligated to see himself or herself as if he or she left Egypt. Right? So we have a special obligation on Pesach of seeing ourselves in the Pesach story. And that's where I think it's critical that we have a primary symbol of the holiday that allows for evolution and change of meaning with the experiences of the person doing the interpreting. So to get more specific, if we are to be the protagonists of the story of the Exodus on the night of the Seder, then that story has to be able to accommodate our experiences and perspectives. So it's not that I'm supposed to imagine myself as an ancient Near Eastern Hebrew leaving Egypt, right? It's that I'm supposed to see myself, me, Raquel, living in 2021 as going through this process of liberation. And I can't see myself in that story if the story doesn't have room for what I have to add to it. And so the history in the Torah of how matzah's symbolic meaning grew from matzah Mitzrayim to matzah Sukkot becomes a message to all of us that the symbolic meaning can continue to grow and evolve with each generation's new insights and that we can add our own layers of meaning and that when we add our own layers of meaning, when we have those wonderful, lovely, charming pages from this book, we're not just subjectively making this ritual more personally meaningful and more personally resonant, but we're actually changing the ritual itself. We actually get to affect what matzah means. It's not that just that it's nice for us, right? When the Jews left Egypt and they were hurried out and there was that second instance of matzah, that actually added to the significance of the matzah. When we do it, when we're in the Haggadah, we don't only say it's lechem lachma anya. We also do the second, the second iteration of matzah in the Torah. So the new iterations, Really what the Torah is telling us is all of those new meanings that change over the, the additional meanings that, that come with new experiences, they actually 
become part of the symbol. It's not just a personal subjective niceness of now I can relate to this a little bit more, but it actually becomes part of the symbol. And, you know, one thing I just wanted to kind of, this, that I like about this idea is it answered, it answered a question or, or, a, or a critique. It, it, it's a good, I think it answers a critique that I heard a number of years ago from someone, I can't remember who, but someone once said to me that it, there's something sort of, I don't just want to say ironic, but we had somehow gone off track at some point in the way that we approach our, our satyrs and our magid, right? What are we told that we're supposed to do on the night of Pes, on the night of the Seder? That we're supposed to be Mar Bebisipur Yitzi at Mitzrayim. We're supposed to expound on the story of the Exodus. But what do we do? In fact, we're Mar Bebisipur Hahagada. Instead, we tell Divre Torah about these rabbis in B'nai Brak and what is Dayenu about? And oh, I'm Kaven Shivim Shana. What is, what is the Ki about? Was he really 70? What is he not? Like, what, who are these four children? Like, what does that have to do with the story of the Exodus? And are we expounding on the wrong thing? And I think, and that that kind of, I don't want to say it troubled me, but it was definitely something that stuck with me for a long time. And I think that one of the one of the ways that that we can answer that that critique is by saying, if the changing meaning meaning of matzah in the Torah, if that teaches us that every successive generation's experience adds to the actual corpus of the story of the Exodus, then. There really isn't such a gap between the story of the Exodus in the Torah and the story of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon in B'nai Brak celebrating Pesach. Because when those rabbis in B'nai Brak are celebrating Pesach, that becomes part of the story of Pesach and the story of the Exodus. And that's also part of what we're supposed to be studying and we're supposed to be talking about and we're supposed to be learning about. And so when we expand, and then when we expound on that in our Seder, our experience of Pesach becomes part of the story of the Exodus. And so you know, when we, and my, at my parents' Seder, we, there's a certain, there's a certain thing we read every single year that my grandfather, who was a pulpit rabbi, wrote um, in one of his, in one of his Pesach letters to his congregations, where he was writing about a beautiful illuminated Haggadah he was given as a gift and how it was so beautiful, but what, upon real reflection, what he determined, that what he decided, what really made it special were the wine stains that could be seen in the printed version of this, of this old illuminated Haggadah, right? That this beautiful idea that what made this Haggadah special is that it was used. So in my, in my parents' house, and also now, in, in our, you know, when, when last year, when we, when Jason and I made, made Pesach in our house during COVID, right? As soon as somebody spilled, the first time wine gets spilled, or magically, if wine doesn't get spilled at some point, we will always take out this letter and read it. And that becomes part of our story of Pesach and our story of the Seder. And the idea being that every successive generation's experience of Pesach becomes part of the Pesach story that we're meant to keep learning. And with that, I would like to just wish everybody a Chag Kasher B'Sameach and a Pesach where you can add your own voice to the story of the Exodus. Um, and if anybody has any comments or questions right now where they would like to add their voice to the uh, to further enrich and add significance to this year, I would love to love to hear it. I don't know. I, I can't. Mute. I, I don't know how to unmute everybody, but Avital probably can do that. Beautiful. I guess, Rekha, I, just, I guess you're giving a new meaning to the term. A person should see themselves as if they left Egypt. In the sense that it's not really about leaving Egypt per se, but seeing your story as as significant as that story, as a continuation of it. And that yes, yes, and that it's all part of this ongoing story. It's not a story that happened once in history and finished, and now we have to kind of imagine ourselves back in it. But that this is a continuing story because what that story really is is the birth of the Jewish nation. And if the Jewish nation is still existing and every new generation is part of that, then that story is really still unfolding. I may have to quote you tomorrow. Okay. Raquel, I really love this. And it also makes me want to eat my matzah a little slower. Like, I feel like the thing about matzah at the Seder is that in this like, in this like rush to eat your shear in a specific amount of time, there's like a tremendous amount of wolfing going on and not a lot of like ruminating. <laughs> um, and in a way it kind of um, jives with the Rosh Bam and the Chizkuni that you brought in the middle, that in the beginning that the like, um, the manner of eating is itself symbolic. And maybe we're just like really getting in our chippa zone in the moment of like eating it super fast. Um, but it does make me wanna dwell on it uh, in a different way than I think it usually gets at my Seder in practice. 
Yeah, I like that. I think though, in some, maybe that though also, um, you, what you keep in mind is is what we think of as the conflict between you have to eat your afikoman by a certain time, but then we know like, you know, these rabbis were saying we're we're being misapper be the separate statements rhyme until the morning until the time of kriyachma. We say how can you have both? And the answer is well, they did the ritual part quickly, and then they took the rest of the night to just kind of take their time, which, you know, maybe matches up with the matzah of Mitzrayim, which was eaten, which was the lechem oni, you had to eat it because you had the, the you know, the, the breathless laborer at your, you know, the overseer at your back, and then the rest of the time you have the freedom to, to sit and, and enjoy and take your time. Raquel, I loved your presentation. It was so thought-provoking. Yeah. Would you consider extending your theory in terms of the symbolism and the evolving symbolism of matzah to maror, because from the Hiskuni's perspective, the maror at Leil Bechorot was really as a method of continually degrading, as it were. But if you take a look at the Haggadah and see how the Haggadah, and Rabban Gamliel, in the Haggadah, the Haggadah describes the maror as So you have that one night, which is just that night, that night when they're eating the Pesach, they're supposed to somehow strengthen their resolve to leave all of Egypt and its culture behind. But later on, Moror becomes sort of the retrospective of 210 years of slavery. So I wonder whether that could also be part of the whole yeah, no, I, I think it does. I think I think that's great that also the that that in the moment it had a very particular meaning in that that one that night's observance. But then in the Pesach Dorot, there's there's the ability to look backwards and see it as a, as part of a larger context and symbolic in a, in a much larger way. I like that a lot. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Raquel. It was great. I really, and Sophie, I really um, was starting to listen with um, very sharp ears when you were talking about the idea of symbols and how symbols evolve and change. And it's almost like the way you describe matzah is like, we're given permission already in the Torah to have a multivocality to symbols. And so um, it's just interesting how that's certainly true for a an isolated period in time and, you know, thinking about does that, can that extend over a longer time? I mean, certainly in terms of Haggadot, here I'm really aging myself, that I'll remember, you know, everyone knows different Haggadot published in different times and certain ones published specifically for the freedom of Ethiopian Jews or an extra cup of wine for Russian Jews. And, you know, so we definitely have symbols like, like that an extra cup, you know, an extra chair for Eliyahu for other people who can't be there, you know, extra cups or even Miriam, you know, so that really is such a ripe time for symbols and almost um, the Seder in its very strictness, but also in its allowance for creativity takes that idea of symbols and I think it is a continuation of what you said, really get, lets us go crazy in an appropriate way to, um, continue to make meanings, uh, me meaningful meanings of symbols without throwing away the old ones, but just keep in adding more and more and more. Yeah, I 100% that it's just, it's a very empowering, it's a very empowering like conception of how we can be, how we can get to the point of Lerota Datsmo, that, that part of that has to be bringing our own, you know, creativity to the table and that, that this sort of validates the experience that I think really is more meaningful for, for us. But I wonder, I mean, just to take that farther, Follow like, up. why why is this Pesach we have to do? Why isn't this just any part of Jewish experience or to make it meaningful for oneself? What's special about Pesach that we need to see ourselves in it? Why not Mamad Har Sinai or Sukkot or anything like that? That's an excellent question. I don't have an answer to that one. That's good. I don't have one. But if anyone else has anything, that that's great. I will say, I, I did think in writing, in when I was putting this together, um, not not an answer to Sophia's question, but in, but in terms of what Anna was saying, that I, I thought Anna's, Anna, I think, will like this because, you know, most of us know, right? Anna has a PhD in Midrash, and this is really where Midrash allows, you know, sort of bringing creativity. So I thought Anna's going to like the... Uh, the room for bringing new new ideas and creativity. So so I feel uh, I feel validated there too. Um, but no. But Sophia's question I think is an excellent one about about why specifically Pesach and why why aren't we sort of enjoying to see ourselves in in the other uh, at least I guess like Sukkot and and uh, and Shavuot right like and 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 Hanukkah and Purim right the the holidays that commemorate historic events that are still part of the story of the Jewish people and I don't I don't have a good answer to that one. I think Raquel maybe there are two answers to that. The first is that 
Pesach is the is, is our foundational holiday. It's our it's our July Fourth. It's our holiday of freedom. So if you're going to have a basic uh, theme that symbols are evolving, that's the holiday to do it. And in, in, in our first holiday, it's 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 in the first month. I think. Secondly, Pesach is a dialectical holiday. Every symbol in Pesach has two meanings. So so. So built into the holiday itself is that symbols are not static. I mean, the, the Luchot have one meaning. Sukkot, okay, and Sukkot, as I think about it, the Sukkot has two meanings. Okay, but only two. I, I heard a shear on Pesach, which went through every symbol. You know, we think of matzah, ischerus, and, and, and slavery, but, but, but yayin is only, is, is only cheirus, and leaning is only cheirus. And I heard a Shia where each and every symbol had both meanings. So in general, it's a dialectical holiday. Symbols have a dialectic. And if you can have two, you can have three, you can have 10, you can have 20. Okay. And, and just so people know that, that's, those are my parents joining us from New Jersey, which was the uh, July 4th reference. <laughs> Not very Canada centric, but, uh, but we're happy to have you here. Uh, no, really very. But, but I think, I think it's, you know, I, I like that. I, obviously, I also, um, just one thing I kind of, I meant to say, mentioned earlier um, was, uh, was that, in terms of thinking about uh, matzah as this symbol where we see in the Torah its meaning evolving, um, what's what's also beautiful is it's not just that it evolved from meaning one thing to meaning another thing, and therefore we can add other meanings. It's that it also evolved to mean, as, as my father was just saying, two opposite things, right? It, it started out, the first meaning is, is avdud, and the second reason, it, the second meaning is chayrut. And if a symbol can mean, can evolve into meaning at simultaneously two opposite things, then that shows us how capacious it is, right? It, it can really accommodate so many meanings. Um, it, and I think that that's something I was also thinking, just something, something else I was thinking about in terms of what the, what that, what those two meanings are, that that allows it to be something that can hold almost infinite meanings. And, and obviously doesn't mean thoughtless meanings, but if, but if there's something behind it, if there's a, if there's something behind the symbolic significance, then, then this, it can hold it. I think also perhaps, um, that Pesach is much more explicit about itself as a model for storytelling, education, transmission, and there's much more um, explicit ex explanation of symbols in the Torah and in the Haggadah, of course, but that perhaps because that is explicit on Pesach, that doesn't imply that it's a practice exclusive to Pesach, it's that Pesach is the holiday that, that teaches us how to do that for ourselves potentially, so that, you know, Sukkot, I think, actually is, is the holiday that poses the greatest challenge because the Arba Minim are these very opaque symbols. Um, and even the explanations we have for them often feel like a little like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> um, I, um, like, I, I didn't really see that, but sure. Um, so I think in that, in that sense that the, the sort of the Pesach lesson about how to do this is something that we should take as an invitation for other holidays rather than seeing it as sort of this unique Pesach thing. Um, to add on to that and to a little bit answer, Sophia, um, there are people in the field of Holocaust education who are really working on trying to ritualize and create new meaningful um, opportunities to commemorate the Holocaust because they feel that without something as kind of cemented and foundational to the Jewish um, calendar and experience like the Seder is, that we won't truly remember the experiences of the survivors and the story of the Holocaust in the way that we remember other parts of, um, of Jewish history, kind of, you know, comparing it a little bit to um, Tisha B'Av and how for large parts of the Jewish community, that's not very meaningful. Whereas the Seder is meaningful for a lot or pretty much every, um, you know, practicing affiliated, unaffiliated Jew. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting thought that like, not just to create more, mean, more opportunities through what's already existing, but for some people, maybe, you know, for good or bad to create new opportunities. Yeah, I just want to also just um, read from the chat now that um, Rabbi Bergman added that Chazal do say that we should see it as if we were, we receive the Torah every day and we're granted Eretz Yisrael every day. And I think taking that and, and kind of building on what my dad said in Zahava and, and Rachel is, you know, it's not that we aren't supposed to see ourselves and have to go through that process for the other 
holidays as well. But that Pesach, both as the first holiday, the foundational of the of the Shalosh Regalim, and also the holiday that really has so much to say about education and meaning and symbols is the one where we learn the message, right? This is where we're taught how to do that. And we can then apply it to the other holidays, but this is the one where we're, where we're being taught it, but, but that we are indeed supposed to bring it to the, up to, you know, to Shavuot as well. Thank you, Raquel. This was really amazing. And uh, I was also thinking that uh, Pesach is the first time we were free to commemorate something. So if we celebrate that freedom, we're able to extend that to the rest of uh, Jewish history where we're free to, to think about and to commemorate and to bring purpose to what we are celebrating. Thank you. This was, this was really wonderful. I really just wanted to thank everybody who, uh, who came out tonight on a Saturday night after a long day. So thank you all and Chodesh Tov. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chodesh Tov to everybody. Thank you. Very interesting. Chodesh Tov. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the prep that went into it. Yeah, it's a lot of prep. Now you can call us. Hello, the Goldbergs. Nice to see you guys from a distance. <laughs> Anyways, it was great. Lots of nachas. Lots of nachas. Very nice. Hi, Jace. Hi. <laughs> How, so are you guys, right. 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 How are you guys? <laughs> anyway, okay, I mean, you can cut out, cut us off whenever you need to. Yes. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you.